think we have a few Grantham people. Any Grantham folks out there? This is the entire population of Grantham, I think. <laughs> it's not a big place. But I have many uh, relatives here. My mother is here tonight. I'm glad that she could come and make the trip, and lots of cousins, aunts, and uncles. And I won't embarrass any of you, but I just thank you all for coming. I've got one other thing to say about Goldsboro, which is this. Um, I you know, live up in the Northeast in Yankee land, and when I tell people I'm from Goldsboro, people actually know where this place is, and it's a pleasant surprise to me. And so, you know, why would people know where Goldsboro is? There's about three reasons why you're famous. I wonder if anybody can guess what any of those are. What? Seymour Johnson's one, that's the easy one. Big Air Force Base here, everybody knows where that is. Others? Anybody else? There it is. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, this is a national treasure, so don't let anybody mess with the formula. This is a big thing. The third thing is actually, it's a little bit geeky, but people in my national security world know a lot about it. And I'm wondering if anybody can recognize this picture. Okay, that is, that is a thermonuclear bomb that landed in a swamp in Farrow, Wayne County, just a few miles north of here in 1961. It's called Broken Arrow, Goldsboro, 1961. Now most of you probably, if you're from here, you know this story. Those who are younger or newer to the area, may not know what happened here, but in 1961, January of that year, a B-52 broke up in mid-flight, had two bombs on it, two fully armed nuclear bombs. One of them falls to the ground and disintegrates. The second one, that's the parachute deploys, it gets stuck on a tree, lands in a swamp in Pharaoh, so just north of here. Not for 50 years did we find out how close we all got, because the classified documents that came out showed the bomb had four safety systems, Three of them were found fully armed when the bomb was recovered. Only one switch was still in the safe position. And that was the difference between a bad plane crash and the worst accidental nuclear de uh, detonation in US history. Now, how bad would it have been? Well, there's Goldsboro right there. Anybody within about eight miles would have been you know, essentially incinerated. And those of us in the sort of the broader area, I'm down here at the bottom, down closer to Newton Grove, we might have survived it. I probably would have had a couple of extra appendages and maybe glowed in the dark or something, but maybe we would have made it. I was six months old at the time. The very next year, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, so it's a wonder to me that we all survived this, this period of our history. I bring it up, actually, because it, it's a segue to what I want to talk about tonight. This right here is an existential threat. A nuclear bomb or a nuclear exchange can destroy a whole city, can wipe out a way of life. Terrorism, on the other hand, is a different kind of threat. Terrorists can kill people, they can cause property damage, they can make people afraid, they cannot destroy a city, they cannot change our way of life, unless you let them. So if you'll take this away with you tonight, if we let fear of terrorism, if we let panic, if we let it sort of take away our freedoms and our values that we all talk about and hold so dear and sing about, or if we make it so that we hate each other and we're suspicious of each other, then that does change our way of life, but that's on us, not on the terrorists. So I'm gonna talk a little bit tonight about this book, The Rise of ISIS, and I'm gonna make a pitch, first of all, that everybody in this room has already been affected by ISIS, and everybody in this room will be affected by ISIS. It's not because they're gonna go and blow up Wilbur's next week, I mean, God forbid that would happen. But what they've done is they've affected our culture, and they've affected our politics. We just had a presidential election, and I'm not political. If you like the outcome or you didn't like the outcome, ISIS was part of our election. They were part of our discussion leading up to the election. I go around the country talking about ISIS, and I could tell you people are very, very afraid of this group. And they're afraid even though ISIS hasn't actually pulled off an attack here. There's been ISIS copycats and people who've done things in ISIS's name. But ISIS has never managed to plan and carry out an attack on this soil. And yet people around the country are unsettled by them. They're unsettled by these pictures of people being beheaded and crucified and all these barbaric things that happen. And people want it to stop. They want somebody who's tough to come in and make it just go away. The problem is, if you do the wrong kinds of things, you can actually make, this, make it worse instead of better. So that's why I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say today is we have to understand the enemy, we have to understand where they come from, what they're about, what motivates them, how to effectively stop them if you really want to do something about this problem. I'm going to start tonight by giving you a little Cliff Notes version of my book. It's about four minutes of video and, and images. None of it too disturbing, but this is essentially a sort of a capsulized version of the book Rise of ISIS. And that doesn't mean you don't have to buy the book, because absolutely you should go do that. But this is our ISIS in a nutshell, and then we'll talk about some specifics. 
واحد سبعة تحت العاصي شاب حما بأكمله في تحت العاصي تحت الع... صليبية والله لك يوما بإذن الله كيوم فرنسا فوالله إن كنا قد دكينا فرنسا في عقر دارها في باريس فقسما قسما بأمر الله لندكن أمريكا وبعقرها في واشنطن بإذن الله تعالى So my book, Black Flags, is a story of origins. It's also a character sketch, digging into the history of the men that gave us ISIS today, starting with this individual right here. This man, Abu Zuk Musab al-Zarqawi, is probably the most important and innovative terrorist personality since Osama bin Laden. He was essentially the DNA, the godfather. Everything that we know about ISIS today emanates from this man's twisted brain. He's the one that brought us beheadings of young men in orange jumpsuits. He was doing that 10 years ago. Everything you see ISIS is doing, you really get the sense that it would not exist without this man, Zarqawi. And in a strange way, Zarqawi would not have existed without us. So if you want to understand ISIS, this is the place we need to start. So every terrorist starts out life as a, as, as a cute little kid. The problem with Sarkawi was he wasn't a cute little kid. He was a vicious little punk from an early age. He's the kind of kid that would cut other friends with, with razor blades. He drank, he used drugs. By the time he was in his teens, he was a dropout from high school. He was a gangster, he had tattoos. He was a brutal thug with a rap sheet. His family tries to intervene in his life and tries to get him on the right path and they send him to the mosque to try to get him some religious training. He ends up going overboard with this, this education that he's getting and decides to do what a lot of young people did in the 1980s in his part of the world, which is to go to Afghanistan. This is where the big fight was going on. This was the fight against the communists uh, in Afghanistan. So he signs up and goes off to become a holy warrior. This is the cradle of the modern jihadist movement. Al-Qaeda comes from here. And for Zarqawi, it's paradise. He finds that he's 
actually good at certain things in life. He's good at killing people. He's a ferocious fighter. And he's part of something that's big and meaningful. A band of Muslim warriors are fighting a great Soviet army, and they're winning. They actually beat the Soviets. They drive them out of Afghanistan. So it's obvious to all these young men that Allah is on their side. And so that's heady stuff for a 20-year-old who's never done anything useful in his life. But then the war ends for him, and so he heads back to his home, which is a little town in Jordan that's been to his house, and that's what it looks like. And this is where he tries to find a new life for himself. But he's this kid, he's been in, he's been in a war, he's had this exciting adventure, Jordan's a little too boring for him, so he starts to find things to do. He gets a little terrorist cell together, they start looking for things to do, things to attack. There's not much to do in, in Jordan, so they start going after symbols of Western corruption, bars, liquor stores, pornographic theaters. One of the guys in the gang gets this idea to go into an X-rated theater and blow the place up. So he gets his bomb, walks into the cinema, the film starts, he starts to get really engrossed in the movie, he forgets all about the bomb, the thing blows up at his feet, he loses both his legs, nobody else gets hurt, and that's the kind of knuckleheads we're dealing with with Zarqawi's gang in the 1990s. So after a while, the, the Jordanians realize they've got a problem. They've got these jihadis who are coming home. They need to do something about them. So they start rounding them up. Zarqawi and his entire gang get thrown into prison. And this becomes the beginning of a, of a transformation for him because in this setting, they're all corralled together because the Jordanians want, don't want them mixing with the rest of the prison population. So they're stuck by themselves in these big rooms. And this becomes the start of a movement that congeals and gets more and more radical. Prison becomes a kind of jihadi university. So in a few years, Zarqawi, the tough guy, who becomes kind of a leader of this gang, goes from being this vicious Jordan street kid, or, or just tough guy, to a vicious convict who happens to be a combat veteran and has become a religious fanatic. Fortunately, he's due to be in prison for a very long time, for 15 years. That's when a first a series of really lucky accidents take place in Zarqawi's life. The first one is this. As mentioned, he was supposed to be in jail for a very long time, till 2009. He would have gotten out as a middle-aged man in his 40s. Instead, what happened is in 1999, the king of Jordan dies. And in Jordan, there's a tradition when the sovereign passes away, there's a general amnesty where political prisoners and other kinds of prisoners are released if they're, they're nonviolent offenders. So parliament gets together, the tribes get together, they come up with a list of people to be sprung from jail. The list grows and grows to 2,000 people long, and Zarqawi is on it. So he is an entire gang get out of jail way ahead of schedule. So what does he do? Well, he's not welcome in Jordan anymore, so off he goes to Afghanistan, to the one place where he felt like he belonged. He tries to reunite with his old hero, Osama bin Laden. Interestingly, bin Laden doesn't want anything to do with him, because bin Laden looks at this guy and says, he's too crazy for us. That's pretty bad when you're too nutty for, for Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, but they looked at him and thought he was too extreme in his ideas, too barbaric in his behavior. They gave him some money, they sent him off to the other end of the country, ends up starting a camp in Afghanistan, then he goes to the mountains between Iraq and Iran, does his own thing, but Al-Qaeda kind of leaves him alone. And that, again, should have been the last time we ever heard of this guy. History intervenes another time. 2003, United States is getting ready to invade in Iraq. We make uh, this big case, we present our evidence to the United Nations, Colin Powell does his famous speech in 2003, uh, February 2003, and he basically presents two pillars of, of, the, of the case for going to war. One is weapons of mass destruction, we think Saddam has them, so we need to stop this, this weapons of mass destruction program. The other is this idea that Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda might be collaborating, might be in cahoots with each other. And if they were, then you know, Al-Qaeda might become much more dangerous. So we were trying to stop that from happening. The thing is, there wasn't much evidence for this or circumstantial bits of evidence here and there, but not a really strong case. But the little bit of evidence they do have is this young man, Zarqawi. This is actually the slide that, uh, that Colin Powell put up for the UN Security Council, saying that this is the nexus that we're warning, warning you about. This is guy, he's somewhere in Iraq, so Saddam Hussein must know he's there. He's been with Al-Qaeda in the past, so we think he might be this, this link between these two very dangerous organizations. There were two problems with this. One was it turned out not to be true, because Zarqawi and, and Saddam Hussein really hated each other. They had nothing to do with each other. The other problem is Zarqawi goes from being a nobody, from being somebody who's not very important, to someone who's extremely well-known, because the Secretary of State of the United States has said he's an important guy. So overnight, he starts getting help. He starts getting people traveling to, to, to Iraq to help him, people sending money. He becomes very influential in, in the jihadist world. And so when the invasion takes place in 2003, Zarqawi moves himself into Baghdad to wait for the American troops. Not bin Laden, not somebody else from, from Al-Qaeda, but this young upstart from Jordan that nobody had ever heard of before. 
So he gets there, and he starts doing some pretty smart things right away. He's not an educated man, as we said. He didn't even finish high school, but he's got a good brain for strategy. And he quickly finds local allies, and he's got plenty of them because there are thousands of Iraqi army officers and thousands of members of the Ba'athist party in Iraq who no longer have jobs. And they're very upset with the American occupation. They're looking to do something to sort of lash out against it. And soon you get this nucleus of the religious fanatic, this foreign radical with his friends and followers, and these Iraqi professionals, army officers, intelligence guys who know how to do things, who know how to build bombs, who know how to build intelligence infrastructure. Those two come together in this organization they call it Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and they become very successful very quickly. They do some dramatic things. They go after very big targets very early on in 2003. They go after the UN headquarters in Iraq, blow the place up, kill the, the leader of the UN mission. They go after the Red Cross. They go after Arab embassies and other foreign embassies, basically trying to chase away anybody who could do us good in Iraq. Anybody could help us. Anybody could help the Americans have a legitimacy uh, with their occupation. He tries to chase away. Then he goes after the Sunni Shia fault line. There are two major sects of Islam in Iraq. There's the Sunnis, who are the minority, but they've led the country for, for most of its recent history, and the Shiites, who are sort of this under, sort of underclass, but a much bigger part of, of Iraq. So Sarkawi so starts blowing up their mosques. He starts killing their leaders. He starts butchering men and women and children in their markets and in their schools with the deliberate intention of setting off a civil war between these two sides of, of Islam. And it works because very soon you have sectarian flight fighting taking place all over the country. And if you look back at the approach, it was actually pretty smart because first, Sarkawi managed to isolate us, driving away people who could help us. Then he ignites a civil war around us, and suddenly the Americans are stuck in the middle, getting shot at by all sides. And this is where, if you remember your history from 2004, 2005, a very dark period of the occupation when we really didn't know if we were going to sustain this thing and where we'd have to leave and just quit and bail out. Because he's so successful, he gets lot, lots more followers. Some 10,000 people from around the world travel to Iraq to join his little band. You get, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda finally has to recognize that these guys are actually doing a lot of good for us. They're helping us. And so Al-Qaeda -Al decides to make him a franchise of Al-Qaeda proper. They call this new thing Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and, and uh, Zarqawi is the leader. But Zarqawi has a very different idea of what jihad should be about. He doesn't really care what bin Laden says for him to do. Against bin Laden's advice, he, he adopts his very peculiar brand of barbarity that becomes his special trademark. One of the first things he does, he understands that bombings are one thing, but there's nothing as viscerally horrible as witnessing the execution in a brutal fashion of another human being. So he finds in America, just a random Philadelphia kid happened to be in Iraq trying to start a business. Pulls the guy off the streets, they put the orange jumpsuit on him because that's so evocative at the time of Abu Ghraib and, and Guantanamo, and this is exactly what, of course, what ISIS does today. So it symbolically makes him sort of the sort of the representative of America, puts him down in front of a camera, that Sarkali with a script reading behind him, reads the guy's death warrant, threatens the Americans with all kinds of, of mayhem, and then with his own hand executes this young man, cuts his own head off. And this is the start, sort of the, the calling card for Sokawi kind of presenting himself to the world. This is the, st the first of many beheadings that will follow. In the meantime, Sokawi becomes this international media sensation. You've got gray-bearded Osama bin Laden on one side reading sermons from a script, very boring. On the other side, you have a jihadist action figure. He's got his black ninja outfit on with New Balance sneakers, shooting machine guns up in the air, killing Americans with his own hand. He's reinventing violent jihad, and it's a different strain than anything we've seen before. What are the main tenets? What's this new jihad like? Well, first of all, this gang makes up its own rules. So Kali, as you remember, didn't even finish high school, so he doesn't know the Quran. He doesn't know theology. He invents things that suit his purposes. So when he does things like attacking mosques and killing innocent Muslim women and children, you're not supposed to do under the Quran, he does it anyway because he essentially just twists and bends the rules to his own thinking. Then he comes up with this more ambitious idea, he's just starting to think about it in 2005, 2006, of recreating the ancient caliphate, this old ancient Islamic empire of, 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 the, of ancient times, which is not just the Middle East, but it's all of North Africa, it's parts of Southern Europe as well. His ambition is to recreate this thing. He also sees himself as this man of destiny, not just an important leader, but someone who will literally bring the earth to Armageddon. They've got their own Armageddon legend in, in, in the Islamic world, and there's this great end times battle that's foretold in which the forces of Islam will defeat the forces of the West. And Zarqawi saw this as his role in history. 
He kept telling his followers, I'm the spark. I'm the one that's going to get this going. Well, spoiler alert, he doesn't quite make it. In 2006, uh, Zarqawi is by then enemy number one for U.S. forces. The Bush administration holds meeting after meeting. How are we going to get this guy? What are we going to do to try to stop him? Finally, we get some breaks. We get some good intelligence. We start to, to get on his trail. We find his, his, uh, his religious advisor. We get closer and closer to him. And then in 2006, we find his hideout. We drop a couple of bombs on it, and he's killed. And there's optimism in the US at this time that Zarqawi's movement has finally been beaten, and we're done with this problem. But it wasn't quite true. That brings us to our second ISIS personality. Many of you know the name Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He's the leader of ISIS as we know it today. In most ways, he's Zarqawi's opposite. Zarqawi was a dropout and a street thug. Baghdadi was a nerd, a bookworm. His goal in life was to be a university professor, a scholar of, of Islamic law. He wasn't a fighter at all. But when the war started, he joined the insurgency because he felt that was his duty as a good Muslim. The Quran says if, if the invaders come, if the infidels come into your country, you're obligated to fight them. I think people in this country might feel the same way the foreign army came here. So he joins the insurgency, even though he has no military talents. And very quickly, he gets himself arrested. And he goes to this place. It's called Camp Bukha. It's in southern Iraq. This is probably, this is Jihadi University on steroids. If you weren't a committed jihadi when you went in, you probably were one when you came out. Essentially, it's just a big warehouse for all these guys to spend all their time together and within barbed wire, and the jihadis create their networks, they train each other, they develop contacts, and over time, they recruit many, many of their, their more senior leaders through this method. So Baghdadi gets released eventually, it ends up joining the ranks again of, of Zarqawi's movement, and rises up because other leaders are getting killed and arrested. They call the, the movement by a new name. It's no longer Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It's something they call the Islamic State of Iraq. But it's an organization that's collapsing. Zarqawi is dead, and many of the other senior leaders are being captured and killed. So why are, they being, why are we defeating these people? It's actually very important to think about how we managed to beat this movement back in the, in the last decade. It turns out that one key reason was that other Muslims turned against these jihadists. In the beginning, the Sunni tribes supported these radicals and these terrorists because they thought they were on their side. Eventually, the Sunnis got tired of Zarqawi and his people, and they joined us in fighting them. And that was really the turning point. The surge was important as well, but sort of changing the hearts and minds of all these normal Sunni tribesmen, the people that ran the businesses, the people who were important in, in Iraqi society, and having them come over to our side was a huge turning point. The other big factor was American firepower, but it wasn't necessarily the big army in the field that, that sort of won the day. It was the special forces guys. It was intelligence operation. It was a discreet use of, of air power. SEALs in the deltas, people who became very good at going after the terrorists night after night. And I've met with many of them. They would describe how they would kick over one safe house during the night, get a bunch of intelligence, get phone numbers, get papers. They'd go to another safe house the very same night. And night after night after night, this is the tempo that developed that, was, that allowed us to finally destroy this organization. So we finally got them on their back. By 2010, there wasn't very much left of Al Qaeda in Iraq. I met with CIA people at the time who said, these guys are gone. They're not a problem anymore. The problem was, for us, though, this happens to be the exact moment when the United States is leaving Iraq. We'd agreed to get out by the end of 2011, so by 2010, we're starting to take off. By 2011, all U.S. forces are gone. The Americans had kept order in Iraq. We'd kept the Sunnis and Shia from killing each other. Once we were gone, the fighting takes place again. See, the Shiites are persecuting, looking for revenge against Sunnis. The Sunnis are looking around for anybody who could help and support them, including terrorists. So suddenly, Baghdadi and his men, who were enemies before, aren't looking so bad. They begin to make alliances once again. This also happens to be the precise moment in which revolutions are breaking out throughout the Middle East. Arab Spring in, in Syria quickly turns into an all-out civil war. And Baghdadi, who's right next door in Iraq, sees a great opportunity. He moves his people into Syria to start to form their own militia group. They now have a, a perfect incubator, a lawless state that's awash in violence and weapons, and they have a new reason to exist. They're fighting not just Americans, they're fighting a dictator. And they become extraordinarily successful almost immediately because they are battle-hardened, they're the best fighters on the rebel side, and they start to get very, very strong because recruits from around the world travel to Syria to join them, people from Iraq come over to join them, and so they, they become very powerful. They give themselves a new name, which is the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, which is our word for or what we call ISIS today. So what is this new ISIS? Well, it's basically Zarqawi's old organization with a few new twists. 
So Kawa used to embrace violence for his own sake, to call attention to himself, to provoke and to shock. ISIS does the same thing, but on a much grander scale. Zarqawi didn't understand the Quran, so he really didn't understand theology, and he made up his own rules. By contrast, Baghdadi, the religious scholar, pays a lot of attention to theology, but he goes out of his way to create theological arguments to justify whatever these guys do. There's always a verse in the Quran, there's always something in the Hadith, so the, the, the texts of Iran, to justify what they're doing, even these brutal acts of murder that you see. So he makes the case that these, they're being pious Muslims and not just barbarians. So this is really Baghdadi defined. He's, he's Zarqawi, but he's regimented, he's methodical, he's professional. Zarqawi understood that horror can be amplified using the internet on a massive scale. ISIS comes along at just the right time to take advantage of Facebook and Twitter and all the other social media that we see. They can become very good at it because they can use it to recruit, they can use it to screen new recruits, they can use it to train, indoctrinate, all at a distance without even having the trainee coming to their country. They employ teams of professionals, videographers, all these videos that you might see on the internet. It's not one guy with a little shaky cell phone camera. It's teams of people taking the pictures from different angles, then going back to a studio and mixing them and making it very slick to appeal to a generation of young people who grew up playing Call of Duty and other war games. It's very deliberate. So the formula works. The idea of ISIS becomes a very powerful attraction. 35 to 50,000 foreigners joined this ISIS army, far surpassing the number of fighters that went to Afghanistan to help um, bin Laden, far surpassing the number that went to Zarqawi uh, to help him in the, in, the 19, in the 2000s. And with this strength of this new army, they overrun Iraqi cities, they capture army bases, they capture universities, factories, banks, they seize hundreds of millions of dollars in hard currency. They do very quickly become the biggest, strongest, wealthiest terrorist group of all time, with resources that Al-Qaeda would only have dreamed of having. And the movement metastasizes. In a year, there are many ISIS states in nine countries. And there are legions of recruits continuing to pour in from, from the West, people with European passports, at least 5,000 from the European Union alone. These are the young people that we're fighting in Iraq and Syria right now. So the battle that you're watching on the news right now, the fight for Iraq, the fight over Mosul, that's one side of the battle. There's a whole more difficult side of the battle, which is the battle for ideas and for hearts and minds. So the next couple of characters we're gonna see really deal with that fight. This is somebody that you might recognize uh, his face. His name is Ab Abdel Hamid Aboud. You'll certainly remember what he did. This was the 28-year-old Belgian who led the terrorist attack in, in Paris in 2015 that killed 130 people. Its background, it turns out, was very close to the prototype of a sort of typical Northern European who joins ISIS. He's a troubled youth, son of, of Muslim immigrants from North Africa. He's well known to police, not as a religious radical, but as just a radical, a bad kid. He goes off to Syria. Initially, he's a little bit depressed by all the bloodshed and, and things that he's seeing. Pretty soon, he's with the program entirely, and he's starting to post videos of himself dragging corpses behind his car. ISIS sees an opportunity in this young terrorist with a European passport, and they quietly send him back to Europe to coordinate attacks there. Paris, the Paris attacks of 2015, become his biggest and final assignment. Why did he do this? Why would this young kid from, from Belgium join this terrible organization and do what he did? My colleagues and I at the time spent a lot of time exploring Abu Oud's story and that of his comrades. So, you know, what do they tell us about why ISIS is able to attract young people like this? Well, a couple of things stick out. First of all, like Sarkawi, like Baghdadi, he became partially radicalized in prison. Before ISIS, he was a petty criminal who was in and out of jail. He was not a pious Muslim. In fact, he was the opposite. There's a kind of culture, a subculture within parts of Europe, this violent, hardcore jihadist who are coming out of jails in, in Europe, in Brussels in particular, other places as well. This is a subculture that has its own code, special ways to walk and dress and cut your hair. It's a gang, just like the Crips or, or the Bloods in Los Angeles, or like some of the white supremacist groups in this country that mix religious symbols and extremist theology with hatred and violence. There are many, unfortunately, little subcultures like this in parts of Europe, and the authorities, because we go there and we talk to these people, they have really no answer for it so far. And it's not just prisons, because the Muslim slums of Northern Europe are ground zero for ISIS recruiting. Muslim immigrants in Europe turn out to be very different from the ones that come over here to this country. Proportionally, there are many more of them. It's about 7% of the population of France is Muslim, compared to about 1% in this country. 
and they happen, they're kind of from a different class. In order to be an immigrant from, from Egypt or from Turkey to come here, you're typically a professional. You come here to, like, to get an advanced degree. You tend to be wealthier, actually, better educated than the average American and a little bit better assimilated. In contrast, European Muslims tend to be North Africans whose families immigrated in the 1960s and 70s as laborers. They're not well integrated into society, and over time they've slipped into this big permanent underclass. Their children, the second generation kids like Baoud, have struggled to find their place in the world. They're not truly European. In fact, they may be resentful of, of the dominant culture in Europe, but they also don't really feel at home in Muslim culture. So they drift into drugs and crime. So this is ISIS's target audience for a couple of reasons. First, because of kids like Abood, these young kids from prison, the ones that are essentially looking to join a gang. They don't care about the nuances, nuances of a theology. They just want to be tough guys. They want to have an adventure. They want to have a purpose in their life. And so they run off to join ISIS. And all, ISIS offers all these things and more. And there's this bigger prize, which is the neighborhood. This is where the fight against ISIS gets a little more complicated. It turns out that ISIS's main reason for carrying out attacks in Europe is to go after the hearts and minds of Baoud's family and friends. There's a perverse logic that goes like this. When ISIS sends terrorists to France, it's not looking to achieve a military victory. It doesn't really think that it's going to get France to pull its troops out of the fight in Iraq. But what it can accomplish is to drive a bigger wedge between French Muslims and everybody else. Ordinary people after terrorist attack will be fearful of Muslims, all Muslims. And the government will be under pressure to crack down on Muslims in general, to round up suspects, to harass teenagers, to, to search their houses, spy on their mosques. And when this happens, how do France's millions of Muslims respond? Well, it'll be, they'll be forced to choose sides. And that's exactly what ISIS wants. How do we know this? Because ISIS actually tells us in their own literature. Right before the Paris attack, uh, there's an English language publication ISIS puts out called The Beak. And they put out this article warning this attack was coming and saying explicitly why they were doing it. It said it was going after methodically this thing it calls the Muslim gray zone in Europe, the millions of people, the Muslims who are straddling two worlds and forcing them to choose sides. If the terrorist attacks can inspire a backlash against ordinary Muslims, then the choice becomes clearer in their logic. This is the quote. Muslims in the West will find themselves between one of two choices. They either apostatize and adopt the infidel religion, go whole hog on the European side, or they can become part of us. They immigrate to the Islamic State. Now quickly, our fourth personality was never really a member of ISIS, but yet all of us associate Omar Mateen with the Islamic State. This is the young man who walked into a nightclub in, in Orlando last June and killed 49 people in the worst mass shooting in US history. We all vividly remember what happened. Mateen told police he did it for ISIS. To this day, there's no evidence he actually was in contact with ISIS, and he actually had a very limited grasp of what ISIS is all about. He mixed their theology with that of Al-Qaeda and, and various other groups, and he really clearly had no idea what he was talking about. People sometimes say that young men like Mateen were inspired by ISIS. I think it's more accurate to say that ISIS, used, that ISIS was used as an excuse. And what do I mean by that? Well, when you look in the background of Omar Mateen, you, you find that he looks a lot like the other perpetrators of Islamic terrorist attacks in this country. He's an American citizen. He's not an immigrant. He's the son of immigrants, somebody who grew up here and looks and talks and acts just like the rest of us. Mateen's ambition in life was to actually be a cop. He began to radicalize, not because of religious teaching or what he heard in a mosque, but because his life was falling apart. He had emotional problems and violent tendencies, and he held a grudge against society because his life wasn't going as he planned. His story is actually very similar to that of the Pakistani-American who tried to blow up a bomb in Times Square back in 2010, or the Afghan-American who set off bombs in New York and New Jersey just a few months ago. None of these guys are in contact with ISIS. None of them were seriously trying to, fur to further the cause of ISIS. All of them were troubled kids with grievances looking to lash out at the world. And in fact, if you look closer, you'll see that Mateen is not that different from another high-profile killer that we know. This is Dylan Roof, the young South Carolina youth who went to a, a church in Charleston and killed nine African Americans. Roof fits the exact same profile. This troubled man in his 20s with a grudge against the world, a boastfulness, a craving for attention, blaming a certain segment of society for all his problems. Mateen and other Muslim immigrants became fascinated with jihadi propaganda online, and they chose to evoke ISIS as a way of justifying their actions as tied to a great cause and not just some pathetic, monstrous act of self-pity. And I highlight this because it actually ties into the debates we're having in this country, and I'm not 
taking a side. I don't get political. I don't even begin to know the answers. But I just want you just to think about this question. When I talk to law enforcement people and intelligence people about what we should do about terrorism, they say several things to me. One they say is we have to do lots of things right. First of all, we have to be very good at screening out bad people, making sure they don't get visas to come to country. That's very important. You can also, if you choose, pick, for example, a list of countries and say that nobody from this country can come to our, to our shores um, you know, for whatever reason. The thing is, that might be an effective thing. It might make you feel better but it won't necessarily have the effect that you want. You might be disappointed about how it goes because the problem we have in this country is not with people coming here to commit acts of terrorism. That hasn't really happened since 9-11. What does happen is kids who are in this country already, already become radicalized through various means. And if you take an overly broad prescription, if you do something that's, that's sort of, it's, it's more of a sledgehammer approach instead of a scalpel approach, you can actually egg, egg, egg these kids on because ISIS is already whispering in their ears saying to them, Omar Mateen, your government hates Muslims. Here's your proof. They're banning people like you. They don't like you. You should stand with us. You know, the one person I, I have to applaud for understanding this very well was George W. Bush, the president at 9-11. If you remember after 9-11 attacks, he went out of his way to be careful with the messages. He knows you can't stop every bad thing from happening, but you have to be careful with what you say because you can provoke things and make things worse. After 9-11, he went to a mosque in, in, uh, in Washington, stood with the people there, and said that people who carried out these acts were not true Muslims. And then he launched a very tough system intended to screen out the terrorists from gaining access to the country. But he did it in a careful way without alienating our best allies, and our best allies being American Muslims and, and who can help us find bad people in their community if they're empowered and encouraged to work with law enforcement, and also our allies overseas, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Turks, others who are supposed to be fighting with us and don't appreciate it when we say things that disparage all their, their religion. So that's the question that we have to grapple with as a country. The point is that sounding tough doesn't always do the job, especially in this second battle, this harder battle of, of ideas for hearts and minds. I hate to end on a dark note because I talk about ISIS, I usually do, so I want to just mention a couple of positive things, reasons to feel hopeful about the fight going forward. Uh, if you're following the news at all, you know things are actually going pretty well in Iraq and Syria right now. We've managed, with we, with our Iraqi allies, have managed to drive ISIS out of the eastern half of Mosul, which is their capital in Iraq. Uh, Raqqa seems to be on the list next. The intelligence people we talked to think that it's very likely that this caliphate that we see in Iraq and Syria will not be here, certainly within a year, maybe in, in less time than that. So that's all good news, because if they don't have a caliphate, it's much harder for them to plan big attacks. We've shrunk the size of their financial uh, operations, cut off their oil wells and other things they do to raise money. Uh, you can see here that the size of the caliphate continues to shrink. It's about two-thirds the size now that it was in 2014. So that's all good news. We see them losing the propaganda war, because mostly because people who come out of the caliphate, defectors and people who leave that part of the world, are coming out with stories about how horrible these people are. So all that propaganda they're doing to convert young Muslims, it's not really having much of an effect. It's even more the case in Middle Eastern countries, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Lebanon. In Lebanon, you have zero percent, statistically zero percent of, of respondents saying that they support ISIS or support what ISIS does. And you can all, can't always trust polls, obviously, in that part of the world. You're never sure if pollsters are going to be given straight answers. But all the trend lines are good in this area. You also see some encouraging things by more of the Arab countries, more Muslims stepping up to the fight. The reason we're winning in Mosul right now is not because of lots of American troops being there. There's 100,000 Iraqi troops who are fighting block by block to take back their own country. And when it's their troops and not ours, it's better for so many reasons, not just because there are fewer American casualties, but because we avoid further inflaming the situation by being invaders and occupiers of a Muslim country, which means a lot to them. Even if they're on our side of the fight against Islam, or fight against uh, or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, they don't like the fact that here's this foreign country taking over parts of the Islamic world. It's a real irritant. So this makes it slow going. Obviously, we went in there ourselves. We could do the job much quicker. But we end up staying for a very long time, as we saw in Iraq. So it becomes dangerous to us in the long run. The other thing that's good is you begin to see glimmerings of a revolution within Islam. This is a very old religion. It's a little different. I mean, we all have our own concepts of it. It's not like Catholicism, for example, or the Southern Baptist Convention, where there's a hierarchy that tells you what to believe. 
These people sent you there, they're more democratic. The Lohu Imams will tell the, their congregation that we're for this or for that, and so they don't really have anybody telling them what the rules are. So now you see this beginning of a movement where responsible Arab leaders and Muslim leaders are beginning to say, we need to take control of our religion. We need to define what, what Islam is and what Islam isn't. They're the only ones that can do that. We can't tell them what to believe. But when you have the President Sisi from Egypt going into the, the greatest, the biggest university in Cairo, the biggest, like their biggest seminary, and telling the Imams, we need a reformation, we need to take control of our religion, that's a very good thing. We need to see more people doing exactly this. Now, despite all the good news, there are challenges ahead that are formidable. And to give you one example, I'll introduce very quickly the fifth and final personality. His name is Taim, that's not him, we weren't allowed to take a picture of him, but he was eight years old when we met him in a refugee camp in Germany. He was one of hundreds of thousands of young children who lived under ISIS in the towns and villages of the Caliphate. Taim, when we met him, was this bright, beautiful young boy who lived in Raqqa, the Syrian city, when ISIS took over. Within months, he was in an ISIS training camp. He was learning to shoot a gun. He was taught that his parents were bad Muslims and he should tell them that they did something that wasn't Islamic. He was taught that his greatest calling in life was to become a suicide bomber. That's the message he was getting at age eight. He also told us about witnessing executions in his town square. He'd go to the local park and see bodies of men with their severed heads stacked next to them. Every now and then he would shut down during our interview, and at one point he asked for a, for a crayon and a piece of paper just so he could draw something. And this is what he drew. This is literally his picture. What he's got here is a scene that he witnessed in the town square in Raqqa. The men from ISIS had a prisoner, a one-eyed man. So up top you see the man with one eye. He had been taken to the town square for punishment. Because he's a kid and everything kind of gets jumbled together, the second part of the scene is the one that's below. That's the one-eyed man with his head severed and on the ground. Taim told the story to us this way. The other man has no eye. They've already taken his eye, you see? And the other men stood behind him, and the, man of the, man, the head of the man with one eye just fell. He pointed to show us. His head just fell, he repeated. Then he closed his eyes as if to make the image go away. No, he said finally, I don't want to remember it. We worry in this country about ISIS recruits, about people being radicalized on the internet or traveling to Iraq and Syria to fight. But we're facing an entirely different problem with a generation of young people who grew up under this terror. Now bring this up because when the caliphate does collapse, as it will, the West will be tempted to walk away as we normally do. But there are costs for doing so. Taim drove this point to home to us when we were interviewing him. After meeting him, I had to ask myself, who's gonna provide psychological counseling to a young boy that's witnessed all this in his very young life? Who's gonna rebuild his school? Who's going to rebuild the economy and offer hope for a job and a family and a future? As Americans, we tend to scoff at, at this kind of problem because we don't, we don't like foreign aid. We don't like to talk about using our good taxpayer dollars in, in our country to help people overseas. But there are very good selfish reasons to take this problem seriously because we don't find a way to address this problem, you can be assured that we're gonna be hearing from young boys and girls like Taim in the future. You can be confident that that kind of extremism and that kind of bar barbarity that we witnessed in the last three years will come back to haunt us again and again. With that, I thank you for your time. Happy to answer some questions. Appreciate your attention. <clears throat> So we got about 50 minutes, and, and questions can be on anything. Talk about ISIS, talk about uh, media, talk about travel to Jordan, or whatever is on your mind. So just happy to take any questions. I think we've got microphones here, and so please just point to one of the people. We're going to start over here on this yeah, part. I'm I sorry. I have a question. I watch the news every day, but on Mosul, I'm kind of confused. I really don't know. Obviously, we have ISIS there, and we have the Russians, I guess, helping the, uh, the existing government. And then who are we if we're there, but we're not fighting on the same side as the Russians or the government. We're fighting with rebels or is it Iraqis? Or, I don't it's the most complicated mess you've ever seen. And it's a little bit different in Iraq because Iraq, we've actually got a pretty good situation right now. We've got what could have been a mess because you've got Shiite armies, some of them supported by Iran. You've got Kurds who are really good fighters, but the Turks don't like them and the Shiites don't like them, so that's a mess. Then you've got the Iraqi army who were humiliated in 24, drove out of Iraq in, in days. They really just kind of just fell apart. But all those groups are together now and they've formed the united front against ISIS in Mosul. And that's why you've seen this city 
fall pretty quickly. Half of the city is now in Iraqi hands, and, and the rest is, being, is under attack block by block right now. So that's kind of an easy situation for us. In Syria, where ISIS really has its biggest base, you've got uh, just a, a million different fighting factions. You've got all these rebels. Some of them are, are, are supported by us. Some are, are just jihadis, like ISIS, but maybe different flavors. And then you've got the, the, the Syrian government, supported by the Iranians, by the, by the Russians. There's, it, it's almost like, like the, the Balkans in, in World War I. There's so many different factions and so many trigger points that this is going to be a very difficult thing to, to, to press forward. We had hoped, and there still could be hope in this, maybe Trump will have some solutions about making sure the, the Americans and the Russians get all the players in one room and try to work out some kind of political compromise. Because just slugging it out is, is really not going to be very effective. And once Raqqa does fall, once, once we're able to eliminate ISIS, we've got a whole other range of problems on our hand. Who's going to run Raqqa? Nobody can agree on that. Is, is it going to be a, a Sunni leader? Is it going to be a Shiite leader? Is it going to be Kurds? And will the, the Turks support a Kurdish government? So it's going to take a lot of diplomacy and a lot of wisdom to put these pieces back together again. I don't see them on the horizon right now. So this is kind of the depressing part for us, and I'm sorry to be depressing again, but ISIS is one thing. ISIS is very serious. What comes after can be even worse, potentially, because we just don't know what's going to come out of this mess. Good question. Here in the front. You've partially answered this, I think, but the current president has assured us that we're going to defeat ISIS. How realistic is that? And if we go all out war against ISIS, will all the other radical troops join in with them? So that's a real good question. And again, I don't, I don't take sides in this. I'm, we're just going let to let things play out as they're going to. But what concerned us early on in the campaign, every politician is going to overpromise. Everybody is going to make it sound easier than it, than it really is. In the case of the Trump administration and, President, and candidate Trump, I think he, he, I think he pretty clearly overpromised Americans what he could do because he said he had the plan for defeating ISIS, he could do it, he knew more about it than the generals. And for those of us who understand this and know the generals and know what they're trying to do over there, literally we, we couldn't figure out what, what he could be talking about. We haven't seen a plan yet, we're not sure what he's gonna do. We think what he's gonna do, after meeting with very able security people that he surrounded himself with, is to really do what we're doing right now, but maybe in, in a more accelerated way. Work with our allies on the ground, work with people who can take over these towns and run them so we're not in the position of having to do that. But that's a tall order. We've seen just in the last few minutes how complicated it can be. We could just hope that, they're, that the new guys are taking the best advice from guys like General Mattis and, and others who really know the situation, who fought in these wars and can really bring these sides together in a productive way. I'm not ruling any of it, any of it out. My only point is that, that you, you have to take political rhetoric and campaign rhetoric with a grain of salt because people will promise you the moon on the campaign trail and they may not be anywhere close to being able to deliver it. So we'll have to wait and see. Good question. Who's got something? Yeah, sorry. I just have the ability to project, so I'm not really too sure whether or not I should go with the mic. <laughs> this is a guy with acting training. I happen to know this for a fact, right? Yeah. So you're good at projecting. Well, there are a couple of things with that. There's some, the similarity is that the barbarism is certainly there. Genocide is certainly something that ISIS practices, not quite on the scale of the Nazis. The, the, so things we can draw from that experience is, one, look what we did after the war ended. We defeated a, a major power in Europe. We didn't just walk away. There was this thing called the Marshall Plan. There's this thing called NATO that they brought up. We were able to help rebuild uh, the German armed forces, now they're among our best allies in the world and are one of the greatest economies in the world. That's not such an easy thing to replicate in a place like Iraq or Syria, but so the idea of helping them become a, a, a real place and a settled, you know, not a democracy, you know, I don't think that's even in the cards, but a place that at least has stability and is not this lawless vacuum in which bad things will happen. You know, the problem in Afghanistan right now, and the reason this is going on so long, it's really ungoverned space. And when you have a place with no government in power, with no security forces that control borders, all kinds of terrible things can happen. So at minimum, we have to help these people, empower them 
to be able to control their own borders. And I hope that's the lesson we draw from World War II. Good question. Get over there in a sec. What caused the rift between the Sunnis and the Shiites, and why can't they resolve it? Yeah, so that, that could be a whole lecture, believe me. So this, it goes back to the earliest, this is actually the very earliest periods of Islam when there was a second, second generation of, 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 of Islamic history when there's a discre disagreement over who's supposed to be the, the, the next leader. Is it going to be the, the uncle or is it going to be the son? And so they, they start having these fights among each other. It gets bloody very quickly. This big split takes place, almost like our Reformation, except it takes place earlier in history and it's, it's brutal. And there's like years and years and centuries, really, of, of, of killing each other. And so you, know, you manage to get, over time, you know, Shiite settling in certain areas, mostly in Iran, that's the sort of the biggest Shiite area, and, but also scattered in other places. And what we've done to make things a bit worse is that after World War I ended, then all these places were once part of the Ottoman Empire and part of that old caliphate. So after World War I ends, the conquering powers, the, the British and the French, get a map of the Middle East and a crayon and just divide the place up. So we're going to have an area of French influence here, an area of British influence here. We're going to create countries that didn't exist before, like Jordan. Of course, Israel hadn't existed before, and that kind of comes out of that process too. We managed to essentially put all these people in the same countries where they're going to be fighting each other, where they're not going to trust each other, we're just really going to make problems worse essentially forever. And so that's A, and then B, it's gotten worse in the last few years because as bad as things have been historically, in places like Iraq, Sunni and Shiites actually got along fairly well. They kind of had to because they lived under dictatorship, but Sunnis and Shiites live in the same neighborhoods, they intermarried, and then when the, when the war took place and when Zarqawi came in and started inflaming tensions and making it so that these guys could do, think of nothing better to do than kill each other, then you've got this animosity that's just erupted all over again and it's much worse than it's ever been. The war in, over the last few years has, has, has complicated the situation too because in Syria you've had you know, a government run by an Alawite dictator who essentially that's part of, of the Shiite faith, it's kind of a heretical branch of Shiism, and, and Sunni majority, and they have been killing each other now for five years. When the war ends, are they gonna get together and be nice again? Probably not. So this is part of this kind of King Solomon's puzzle of putting this area back together when all these people dislike and in some cases despise and want to kill each other and that's that's the situation we have right now question okay sorry to make it quick to mr porter uh joby uh i heard that two or three months before the war you wrote an article for the washington post that i'd like to if you recall that uh to explain what how the editors received you then and how they received you a couple of years later. This is uh, Weapons of Mass of Destruction? Heat. WMD? Took a lot of heat for was that, the... Was that WMD, the WMD story? Or the, yeah, the, the, the Weapons of Mass, okay. yes. Yeah, okay. So it's actually pretty apropos right now because of the, all the talk about fake news. I gotta tell you, and those of us who are in, we call them professional news organizations, the ones that take our jobs very seriously, that worry about like accuracy because accuracy is our reputation. If we get something wrong, it's not something that just drifts out in the internet and, and people can, can criticize it. If people have a factual problem with something I write, even if it's a misspelled name, they let me know about it. And if they're right, I have to correct it, and that's embarrassing. And if it's worse than that, if it's a serious mistake, it's a stain on my reputation as a journalist. That's why we're very careful with our stories. We talk to a million people. We try to make sure that even the nuances are correct. There's a lot of work that goes into those stories you see in print every day. I had this situation in 19, so 2002 and three, when I, was, I had been an environmental reporter covering uh, nu you know, nuclear safety and things like that. 9-11 happens, I end up having to write about weapons and mass destruction. It's a long story how I got there. But when the, when the Bush administration is getting ready to, to make this invasion, they're making the argument that there's a WMD threat. And my job was to figure out if that was really true or not. And so at the New York Times was reporting that it was true and there was this, this possibility of a nuclear cloud going up and we're all gonna be sorry that we didn't stop this WMD program. But I couldn't find it. I mean, I, I would talk to defectors. We would try to get them to show us where they thought the program was and where the secret labs were. And they would show us pictures and satellite photos. In every case, it just evaporated. The closer you looked at it, the more sort of suspect or, or just crazy it sounded. 
the end administration had this uh, argument that there were these aluminum tubes that Iraq had gotten to build centrifuges with. This is sort of the key piece of evidence for the WMD program. Well, we looked at those aluminum tubes, and we asked experts, people who really knew about aluminum tubes and centrifuges, can you use these for, for a centrifuge? It turns out you couldn't. They were, very, they were perfect for rockets, artillery rockets that, that the Iraqis had. They were not suitable at all for, for centrifuges. And we reported this in the paper. My own editorial page thought I was wrong, and so they actually editorialized against my own stories. But we persisted in saying, raising these questions, because that's our job. Our job is not to be cheerleader for anybody, to make any politician, left or right, feel comfortable. We need to be, as your representatives, un unpaid in the sense that you don't hire us to do this, our job is to ask tough questions and demand evidence. And the administration would just kind of scoffed at the stories and say, oh, wait till we get to Iraq and you'll see all this WMD stuff floating out from all over the place. And it turns out that we were absolutely right in our, quite in our suspicions at least, pointing out the fact that there was no evidence and no evidence had been presented anywhere that made sense. So that is why I'm, and I know this is such a, a loaded politically time for us right now. And you guys are all free and it's you to make your own judgments and, and, as your heart leads you. But when people will uh, disparage a, a newspaper article or even entire parts of the media just because they disagree with the questions or disagree with the conclusions, look more closely at that. And if I could just leave this with you, you know, it's really hard as citizens right now to separate what's accurate and what's honest and what's true. And you can't even, you can't trust the Washington Post because we'll get it wrong sometimes too. But what you need to do is do your homework and look at who's reporting this story. Does this, does this newspaper or this organization have a history of, of clear bias, or do they try to report on both sides? Do they have documentation to back up their stories? Who are they talking, who are the sources? Where's the source of information? Does the, the same information appear in other credible, pred, credible news organizations? And that's a lot of work for people who you know, work in a store or, you know, or run a business. But if you want to be an informed citizen, you can't just take one group or one organization's word for it. You really have to do your homework and compare lots of sources. And I think we're over our time. I've really enjoyed this. I'll be in the back for a little while if anybody wants to buy a book. I'm not a book salesman, but they're back there if you want them. And I'm happy to answer more questions and talk to you guys back there if you want. Thank you again for your time. Give him a round of applause.